Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Who. Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas to everybody. May the blessings of the Lord rest upon you and rest upon your family this Christmas. Today is a very special day. Not is it just a regular weekly message, but today is Christmas Sunday and it's Christmas Day all rolled into one. So Merry Christmas. May the blessings of the Lord rest upon you. I hope that you were really, really good this year so you could get exactly or that you did get exactly what you wanted for Christmas. Anyway, today's message is entitled The Decree of Caesar Augustus. So turn with me, please, to the real Christmas story found in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. You know, it doesn't actually feel like Christmas until this story is read, Luke chapter 2. And especially this, this verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That is the true and real Christmas story. Yet there are those unbelieving critics who attack Christianity and they attack the Bible by claiming there is no proof that a decree actually went up from Caesar Augustus as mentioned in Luke chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore the Bible is in error and cannot be trusted. I mean, these people try so hard to disprove and discredit God. A God that they claim that they do not believe in and that do not exist. Yet they hate him with a passion. How can that be? And he seems to be a very strong and powerful God. Since, since he don't exist, but yet he can attract such hate and attention, forcing brilliant detractors to spend their lives heckling over and trying to challenge his existence. And yet, they fail every time. And you know what? This time is no different. Remember that both God 
and his word are eternal. Both God and his word are dependable. Both God and his word are full of truth and grace. I can assure you that God is not a man that he should lie. So don't let doubters or scoffers or liars lead you astray. God is real and his word is truth. Luke himself is considered a reliable historian and his gospel was written before the book of Acts. Luke was also a companion and fellow worker with the great apostle Paul, St. Paul. It is greatly accepted that Paul began his ministry around AD 49. So the book of Luke would have been written somewhere close to that time period, probably somewhere in the AD 50s. That would suggest that many people and many scholars of that day were still alive who would have witnessed that census. But there's nothing written that disproves um, Luke's claims of a census or even challenges his claims. If Luke was in error, he would have been called out by historians of his day, don't you think? But as it is, nothing to the contrary has ever been found. Neither will there ever be. The people alive back then knew these facts to be true. So they did not dispute them. Why? Because they couldn't. And, and what, what I'm saying here, right, is that we believe a true and real gospel. And Luke's statement in Luke chapter 2 verse 1, And it came to pass that in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed is a true and accurate statement. Jesus is alive. Yes, he was dead, but now he's alive and well. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's coming back to get us. And that time is real, real soon. That time is nigh upon us. We believe truth and not some well-organized lie. So feel confident this Christmas to be your best Christmas by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you haven't done so already. Because if one part is true, it's all true. But if one part is a lie, it's all lies. I want you to think about this for a moment. Hundreds of years prior, even before there was a Roman Empire, God decided that his son would be born in the manger in Bethlehem of Judea. That he would have a virgin birth. Caesar Augustus was not even thought of yet. He wasn't born much less being the emperor of Rome. Matter of fact, Rome was not even a world power at that time. But God coordinated all that happened to happen. Jesus thought, or Caesar, Caesar, Caesar thought he was doing his own thing, but it was the will of God that was being fulfilled. There's a proverb that says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1. That is not saying that we're all programmed robots, but it's saying that God is a powerful and knowledgeable God, and it is His will that prevails. Now, think about this. Think about the logistics of the decree. Let us read Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And then we're going to skip over verse 2 and drop down to verse 3. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went up from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Down to verse 3. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. If you think about that, 
That was a very huge demand. Millions of people traveling. Millions of people need lodging. Millions of people needed food to eat and water to drink. I'm sure the empire, or, or the Roman Empire, did not make sure that all these things, all these provisions, were provided for these travelers. But nonetheless, that government expected this all to happen, just as, as Caesar had decreed it to happen. According to research, Bethlehem lay 70 miles south of, south of Nazareth as the crow flies. But I'm sure the road was winding. The road was rough. And not only that, but Samaria lay between. And you know that the Jews did not pass through Samaria. They went around Samaria, making the trip even longer. Also, we need to remember that Mary was almost full term by then. Therefore, doubtless to say, they had to probably travel even slower because of mother and the unborn child. Therefore, the trip could have taken seven to ten days depending on the speed of travel. So with all that in mind, I want you to imagine that it's not just Mary and Joseph traveling as lone travelers because I believe that they probably were accompanied by friends, family members, and many others who were going in the same direction, going to Bethlehem to be registered just like they were going. So. It made traveling safer if they traveled in big groups. The more the merrier, they say. People were all pouring in while others were packing up and embarking on their own travels to their own home places, their own places of birth to be registered. You see, God needed Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem at that time. That was the right time. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. So he needed them to the place where he had predetermined because he needed them to, Jesus to be born in the manger. He needed him to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. He needed the shepherds to come. This was all thought of and predetermined by God himself at the right time. And so it was that this decree came out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed according to God's plan. And each man was to go to his own hometown to be registered, thus fulfilling God's word, God's prophecies. So nevertheless, do not be afraid or intimidated by these doubters to believe that scripture is accurate and scripture is true. Listen, if God is able to speak the whole universe into being and then uphold everything by the word of his power as scripture teaches us, then he is more than able to uphold and keep his word undefiled from errors and undefiled from plunders. Our God is a strong and mighty God. He can do whatever he wants to do, bring about whatever he wishes. There's nothing that can hinder him, and there's nothing that can prevent him from accomplishing whatsoever he will. Therefore, I am fully persuaded, and you should be too, that God, God's written word it's true because God is able to keep his word intact and preserved for the believer. That's us, us Christians, to have as a true and clear path to follow without fear. Without fear of intimidation. Without fear of following something that is not true. I want you to take a look at a few verses with me. The first one that we'll look at is Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. Tell me, please, tell me, how can Almighty God perform something that is no longer accurate, that is no longer true to what he had said originally? And secondly, if he is watching over his word and he's this all-powerful being, this all-powerful God, and he's watching over his word to perform it, do you seriously believe that he will let it get corrupted? 
I don't think so. Look at Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25. For I am the Lord, I will speak the word that I will speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, but in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord. Here the Lord has decreed disaster for the house of Judah. And he said that he will no longer let it be delayed because, because it was being delayed because of his love for his people and his unwillingness to totally wipe out the house of his servant David. So he delayed his word. But he said no longer will it be delayed because why? The people would not repent nor would they even consider turning back to God. So God had no choice but to conform and bring about that which he had decreed, that which he had, had, had threatened. He had no choice but to perform his word, although he didn't want to, because God would rather forgive than to punish. He's a good, good God. He's a good, good father. So he said, enough is enough. He had no choice. Enough is enough. I will speak and I will perform it and it will come to pass and nothing will delay it. Nothing will prevent it because I've had enough. Enough is enough. Just like God said that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, would be born in, in the manger in Bethlehem and it happened, so shall his word be kept undefiled throughout all eternity. Nothing can nor nothing will ever tint the word of God. So go ahead, believe. God word, God's word is not corrupted as the God haters try to viciously smear it as being. And thus throwing people into confusion. They don't know if they could believe God's word because doubters, liars say that it's erroneous. It is not erred. God's word is true and accurate. So you can believe without a doubt that Dr. Luke was historically correct and accurate when he wrote that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. For all that to happen sounds impossible. It's too much for people to believe. That's impossible. He can't predict all of these things uh, hundreds of years before and every single thing as, uh, as it was said, so it came to pass. That's impossible. But the word says nothing is impossible with God. I heard Bill Johnson Pastor Bill Johnson teach on the verse, nothing is impossible with God. He said that he learned it from Jack Taylor. But anyway, this is the gist of what he said. He said, the word nothing is actually a combination of two different words. First, it is the word no. Then it is the word rhema. Now understand that in the Greek, there's two words that describe God's word. The first is logos, which would be the written word of God. And then there's rhema, which would be the freshly spoken word of God. So now, with that in mind, this verse is, verse is starting to take shape with a dynamic meaning. And it would read this way. No freshly spoken word of God shall be impossible. Now, let us define this word impossible. This word impossible means without ability. So here is where the meaning of this verse, where these words are fully defined in the translation, is so deeply profound and so deeply amazing and powerful. It gives a whole new perspective on that verse. So when, when translated with all the words fully defined, this is how the verse would read. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform it. That's powerful. That's so powerful, I want to say it a second time. 
No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. If we, if us Christians, his children, can just get that needed, like dough, like, like, like yeast into dough, just get that needed into our spirits, like Mary had it needed into her spirit. The angel of Gabriel, or, or, or the angel Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary, Luke chapter 1, verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Here is what the angel Gabriel was saying and what Mary understood. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. Therefore, do not worry about the intricacies of how it will happen. God said it, and so it will be. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can, can, can mash it up. Nothing can prevent it. Why? Because God watches over his word to perform it. If we can just get that deep down in our spirits, we will, be, we will see signs and wonders and miracles and great acts of healing. Because by his stripes, you are healed. You are already healed. Jesus paid for you. Just, just, just believe it and receive your healing. That is exciting. All we got to do is to believe that if God said it, it will come to pass. And no power in heaven or on earth or under the earth can thwart, corrupt, or destroy God's word. It cannot be prevented from coming to pass. Therefore, rest assured that there was a decree and Mary and Joseph both went to Bethlehem to be registered. And there in Bethlehem, baby Jesus was born was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and was laid in the manger, according to scripture. Just like Caesar Augustus sent a, dec a decree saying that the whole Roman world should each go to his own hometown to be registered for tax purposes, Jesus has set out a decree himself. Not that you should go to be registered, but that you should Come so that your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. The world says, go. Jesus says, come. The world says, pay. Jesus says, receive freely. The world says, I don't care how you make it there. Jesus says, I am the way. Follow me. I will help you. The world demands. Jesus invites. There is a world of difference between the world and Jesus. To heed him, we have to heed him. He is the only one that truly holds life. He's the only one who truly cares. He has the words of life. He alone has the words of life. Listen, Jesus is calling. He's standing at the door and knocking and waiting for you to open up the door so that he can come into you and sup with you and have fellowship with you and you with him. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He will save you. There is a better way. You might be stuck in a, in a rut, but there is a better way. Come to Jesus and he will make all your crooked paths straight. Yes, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. But happy and blessed are those who find it. Jesus promised that he, he would come once and he did come. He has promised that he would come a second time. Do you not think, do you not believe that he will not fulfill that promise as well? Of course he will. Of course Jesus is coming back. Of course we need to be ready for when he returns. So after all is said and done, after all is looked at and evaluated, after all things are considered and there is truth and truth will always prevail. Truth will always overcome. Truth will always endure. 
for his truth endures forever. This is the truthfulness of the Christmas story. Believe it and live it. As mentioned beforehand, Jesus said that he will come back to get us one day. Let us then consider these things and store them up in our hearts that we might be ready to meet him when he returns to get us. Jesus told Nicodemus that in order to receive the gift of life, he must be born again. And that still holds true for us today. I read a story about a well-to-do woman who was upset with D.L. Moody because he suggested that she be born again just like everyone else, even the lowly. The story goes like this. A woman who was a very busy church worker waited for D.L. Moody after he had told a group of church workers some very plain truths from God's word. Mr. Moody, said the angry woman, do you mean to tell me that I, an educated woman, taught from childhood in good ways and all my life interested in church and doing good must enter heaven the same way as the worst criminals of our day? No, madam, said Mr. Moody. I don't tell you at all. God does. He says everyone who would enter heaven, no matter how good they think they are, or how well educated, or how zealous in good works, must be born again. And so it is. If we want to receive eternal life, if we desire to, to, to enter eternity, and who doesn't? You must be born again, meaning you must come to Jesus. You must confess your sins. You must turn away from them, meaning that you do not do them anymore. You don't participate in the wickedness that you used to do. You don't crack those, the, those coarse jokes anymore. You don't say the vulgar things you used to say. You don't drink and carouse like you used to. You turn away from those things and you, you seek holiness. And if you do that, you will be saved. You will receive the gift of life. Today is Christmas Day. The day we celebrate the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God. Let us celebrate him by keeping his commandments to love each other, to love our neighbor, to love even our enemies. And we have many enemies because the world hates Jesus. They first hated him, so they will hate us. But don't let them keep us or intimidate us from coming to Jesus and receiving eternal life. So I wonder, this Christmas, is there anyone out there who would like to have, who would like to receive the gift of eternal life? If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you don't know him, then you do not have eternal life. So if you would like to accept Jesus and receive eternal life, all you need to do is to repeat this prayer that I'm about to pray. Believe it with your heart. Mean it with your, with your mind. When you say mean it, and you will receive eternal life. Say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to believe with beyond a shadow of a doubt. Help me to love my family. Help me to love my neighbors, my co-workers. Help me to even love my enemies. Thank you for forgiving me. Help me now to forgive others who have sinned against me, who have hurt me, who have wronged me. Now, Lord, help me to live for you. And thank you. I receive your free gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you for your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As usual, what I would like for you to do is to get your Bible down from off the shelf, dust it off, or if you don't have one, go out immediately, today. If not today, tomorrow. Buy yourself a Bible. 
Begin to read that Bible every day. It's essential that you read God's Word. That's how He speaks to you. Get a highlighter. Highlight those promises. Highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. Stand on those promises. Believe those promises. Because if God said it, it will happen. If God promised you, it will come to pass. All you got to do is to believe, depend upon Him, and live the way He told you to live. And it will happen for you. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. The next thing you need to do is to find yourself a Bible-believing church. A church who still believes in a right way, in a wrong way. A church who still believes in holiness. Who believes that Jesus is coming back to judge the quick and the dead. Who still believes that Jesus is looking for holiness. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Turn away from those churches, those progressive churches who say that you can live like the world, look like the world, do whatever you want to do, talk in a way you want. Turn away from these churches and find a good Bible-believing, Holy, Holy Ghost-filled church. Join that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing, that he expects you to be doing. And he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of the Lord. Enter into life. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us this Christmas day. Merry, Merry Christmas to you and to your family. May the blessings of the Lord rest richly upon you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord heal you. Whoever is suffering with, 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 with sicknesses or diseases, the Lord heal you now. Receive your healing. The Lord, by His stripes, you are healed. Peace. May His peace rest upon you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.